Hello. I'm just checking to see if I'm actually live. Is somebody on the technical crew to say that I'm now speaking to the thousands of people who've signed up for us this afternoon? Am I? Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, sorry about that. Uh, we're um, on the cutting edge of technology th this evening, talking about some ancient technology with uh, Professor Michael Scott. Um, you probably um, seen him on the telly. He's on telly more often than Simon Cowell. Uh, some of his um, programs have the enticing title of Delphi, Belly Button of the World, Omphalos, Guilty Pleasures, Luxury in the Ancient World. And today he's going to tantalize us and delight us with the Roman DIY, which is uh, part of the Classics for All lockdown lectures. Um, Classics for All, for those of you who don't know what we're about, I'm sure many of you do. It's a rather brilliant um, charity, which is focused on the re-establishing of the teaching of classics in state schools. Um, I myself was a, um, an alumnus of the, um, of the comprehensive system in Liverpool in the 60s and 70s. And I was taught uh, the full smorgasbord of classics, Latin, ancient Greek, uh, ancient history. And I went on to read that at Cambridge, all free of charge. And of course, those days have gone. And uh, we are now seeing the fact that the, that the teaching of classics uh, and has been struggling in state schools and Classics for All is determined to reverse that trend and is doing a brilliant job. We're now in hundreds of schools across the land, uh, taking teachers uh, who are motivated enough to go on our course for a couple of days and take their uh, cohort of pupils through to GCSE, A-level and beyond. So it's been a fantastically successful charity, but of course it's been struggling in lockdown and we need your support. So. We're delighted that you've joined us um, this afternoon. Um, Michael will speak for about 30 minutes. As he unfolds his information and um, obviously stimulates questions in your mind, please feel free to ask those questions and use the Q&A logo at the bottom of your screen, not the chat room, but the Q&A. And we will try and answer as many of those questions at the end of his talk when, when I'll be putting those questions to Michael. So I think without further ado, I would like to now hand over to uh, Professor Michael Scott for Roman DIY. Thank you very much indeed, Jimmy, and thank you to Classics for All for the invitation to uh, speak and thank you to you all for taking the time uh, to join this evening. So I'm going to share uh, a PowerPoint with you now, hopefully uh, that will be up on your screen. Um, and uh, we are kind of in the crazy world of lockdown, where we were, and who knows what will happen uh, in the next weeks. But one of the things that was very clear during lockdown was that we all turned towards DIY uh, and home improvement. One of the few businesses to really benefit uh, from uh, the uh, lockdown was uh, places like B and Q, uh, um, and uh, they were suddenly seeing an absolute surge, a 20% uh, increase um, in their sales during lockdown. Um, and uh, kind of the Kingfisher Group, which runs B and Q and Screwfix and businesses like that, saw overall a four-fold increase. And so that got us thinking about what does DIY look like in antiquity, or as we've uh, come to call it uh, after consultation with my learned Latin speaking colleagues, uh, sine servis, although I'm also a fan of sine fabris without craftsmen, uh, it's very much do it yourself. And we've also had a go, as you can see, at uh, kind of translating B and Q, which I had no idea was actually originally Mr. Block and Mr. Quail, uh, into Caudex Cotonixque, Blockhead and Quail, uh, and home base as Fundamentum Domesticum. So thank you very much indeed to Clive Letchford, a colleague of mine at the University of Warwick in the Classics Department uh, for those suggestions. But the problem is that if you just do a simple Google search uh, for DIY in antiquity, uh, you get this. 
um, you get brilliant and very useful uh, thoughts on how to make Roman blinds uh, or how to uh, recreate your own toga at home um, and uh, kind of how to even recreate a Roman hairstyle if you fancy it uh, or indeed Roman jewellery, uh, cut out model of the Colosseum if that's your favourite thing or indeed my own personal favourite, how to build your own aqueduct and I presume that was in miniature rather uh, than full scale. Now, these are all useful and good activities. I think we'd all agree, particularly during lockdown when, and, and schools were closed and we were all homeschooling, who wouldn't have given uh, their right arm for a build your own aqueduct kit? Um, and possibly for adults as well, while we're at home, if you want to uh, get involved as a new. But if we start thinking about DIY uh, in the ancient Roman world, in the surviving sources, and what DIY might actually have looked like within a Roman context, it actually turns out to be a very interesting exercise. And I must, before I uh, get into this, thank my partners in crime for helping me think through this, particularly Professor Alison Cooley, again, a colleague of mine at Warwick Classics, uh, Clive Lechford, Latin expert at Warwick, who I've already mentioned, um, and indeed Katrina Kelly, who's the chair of the Lindemann St. Anne's Classical Association that I preside over, who's an expert herself on Roman gardens, um, who contributed very much thinking about what people were doing in their gardens as well, because of course, B&Q reported that sales of plants and garden items outstripped much else during the lockdown. So we're going to be thinking about DIY in the home, DIY in the garden, and then I want to think about uh, a particular case study we can turn to, which is Pompeii, so often such a great case study of so many things, um, to see some DIY home improvements in action, frozen in time uh, by the eruption of 79. So what did home improvement, renovatio, uh, look like? And why hasn't it been a subject of more study? This is the thing that I found absolutely extraordinary. In fact, it's very hard to find any kind of study of what this kind of home improvement might have looked like in the Roman world. If you look, turn to many books directly about Roman housing, they don't have any references in their indexes to repair, restoration, renovation, and any of those kinds of terms. Um, and I think there's two reasons for this. The first is um, that uh, kind of, when we think of Roman architecture, we're actually sort of seduced by this concept uh, that the Romans designed and built things and got it right first time uh, uh, using universally accepted uh, models. You know, think Vitruvius, his manual on architecture, um, they just got it perfect first time. There was never any need to do any of this kind of work. Yet, actually, recent surveys of Roman buildings uh, on the ground have identified how much Roman builders did improvise on the job. Whisper it quietly. You heard it here. Indeed, there was a survey of bath buildings from across Roman Britain uh, done by Tony Rook. And of the 126 bath suites he looked at, uh, they all differed so widely from one another in detail and plan that some had alterations that were so impractical and so many layers of alterations that he concluded that they were all DIY jobs or else done by local bodging builders with no oversight. Oh dear, cowboy builders were at large in Roman Britain. And, you know, I don't think it was just Roman Britain either. But I think there's a second reason. It's not just that we're seduced by this idea of the Romans getting their architecture right first time. It's also because when we, we're reluctant to think about renovation, restoration and the reuse of materials, because of the wider associations between reuse, repurposing, with the narrative of Roman imperial decline. Uh, often that idea of reuse, scavenging, repurposing, cost cutting, it's all things that the Romans supposedly did once they were in the process of downfall, not while they were at the height of their gain. And again, here I think we've got it wrong because actually renovation was an incredibly important part of the Roman outlook on the material world they constructed and reconstructed continually around them. In fact, incorporating the past and kind of redeveloping and building on the past 
was an incredibly important thing to do in Roman society. And when you start to look at the Latin, there's actually tons of words for it. Renovare, reficare, restaurare, radare, restituere. Remaking, it turns out, in the Roman world was actually something worthy of respect. And you don't need to look very far to see it. Because here is one of the most famous buildings from the Roman world that is absolutely uh, an example of just that. Famously a structure funded and built by Agrippa, built in 27 to 5 BCE, destroyed in a fire of 80 CE, a new structure built on the site by Domitian, burnt down again in the early 2nd century CE, and then it was a Hadrian Trajan rebuild, what we see today, famously making clear that lineage all the way back to Agrippa. And the brick stamps that are on uh, the Pantheon absolutely demonstrate that emperors after that point did all they could to keep the building in good repair. Antoninus Pius was at a bit of renovation, so was Caracalla, so was Septimius Severus, although I doubt they were doing it themselves. What we've come to realize is that the Roman world is a real world of recycling and materials that went hand in hand with production. And in fact, elite donors were often more likely to pay for an extension, an addition or a renovation of a building than actually a new building, because it put them in to the lineage of famous past ancestors. And we could have a think about in Pompeii, the Temple of Isis. Uh, this is, there's a great inscription on this building. How about how Numerius Popidius Calcinus rebuilt it at his own expense uh, when he was actually only six years old. It was something that rich Romans really got into the habit of. And the inscription was set over the main entrance to the sanctuary. Now, we've also seen this trend recently emphasized in honorific statues in Rome. There was lots of reuse of honorific statues. So if we've accepted that this happened all the time in public buildings, public architecture, and indeed in honorary statues, why haven't we thought about it in terms of the humble home? And I'd suggest that there's some good PhD topics out there for those who want to think about home improvement in the home. Uh, and tonight, I just want to give a few thoughts and ideas about the places we might look. So I think the key point to make, if we look at the sort of general outline of the Roman home here, is that Roman houses, because of the methods of construction and importantly, the activities that were going on within them, Think about all those lit fires. Think about all those oil lamps producing soot and smoke actually required constant maintenance and upkeep to keep them in working order. So we know, for instance, if we do turn to Vitruvius and his manual on architecture, that houses were supposed to be designed to make it easy to clean them and to ensure their upkeep. So Vitruvius, for instance, says that buildings should be designed with plain cornices so that they can be easily dusted, especially if there's going to be a fire or lamps in the room. And in winter dining rooms, where there's definitely going to be a fire to keep you warm, fine paintwork and decorative cornices are not to be used. They're too difficult to keep clean. And this was a real shock to me that actually this idea that the, the focus on how upkeep and maintenance of your home was such a continual and important aspect of living in your home, that in the laws of Rome and the Roman world, you actually had to provide the equipment to keep your home up to spec as part of your sale. Um, so in the Roman Digest, which tells us lots and lots of good details about Roman law, it turns out that when you sold your home, you had to provide what was known as the instrumentum as part of the sale. You couldn't just sell the building, you had to sell it with the kit to keep it up to scratch. So we're told in the digest, and I think this is a brilliant idea that we should start to uh, bring into bear in sales of properties now again today, you had to include poles to brush away cobwebs, sponges to clean the columns, pavements and balconies, ladders to reach high spaces and ceilings. And you also had to include things with which to fight fires in a house. Uh, you had to include vinegar, rags, poles, more ladders, sponges, water buckets and brushes. It was quite some list that Roman law insisted you hand over when you handed over your house. 
Now, this need to keep the house in constant uh, kind of cleanliness and actually how much, their work, the, how much work there was to do in doing that is referenced for us in some of the great Roman writers. So Juvenal, in his satires, talks about the need to constantly sweep the floors, polish the columns, getting spider webs down from the ceiling corners. And masters might be particularly worried before they were hosting some kind of great dinner party or other event having guests over to their house. Apparently, one of the worst things that could happen to you was that your atrium would be fouled by dog poo at the last minute or your portico would end up getting splashed with mud and you'd end up having slaves around just to in case these last minute accidents happened that had to be cleared up. And that was particularly necessary for those wealthy Romans who owned more than one house and moved between them. When a house had been shut up for a period of time, uh, you had to do an awful lot more work to clean them up and get them ready to do so. And the slave population within your own home wouldn't necessarily be enough to actually do that. We know that passers-by, sort of people looking for jobbing work, would turn up when they knew a, a rich Roman's house was being opened up for the summer season in order to be brought on staff just to help with the cleanup uh, for the hope of a free meal afterwards. But it just in that general day to day idea, if you've got a fire going in your room, it's producing a lot of ash, which would need to be swept away. And Cato, in his, di his dialogue on farming, uh, kind of is absolutely kind of apoplectic about the amount of time that one needs to spend uh, sweeping away ash. And one of the most important things you could use to clean up uh, both the ash from the fire, the spills from the dinner the night before, and generally keep the place clean, the cleanest friend in the Roman world was, get it, not domestos, but sawdust. Yes, sawdust was the thing you used to absorb grease and liquids that could then be swept away uh, and cleared up and taken uh, in other directions. And in fact, if you look in the dining rooms of very expensive Roman houses, you'll find that they're built with little water drainage ports in the room to help them get rid of the dirty water and other uh, liquids that have been used to wash them um, alongside that sawdust. Now, who was doing this? It was not the master of the house. It was, of course, his slave population. And indeed, can you believe it? There was even a slave known as the Analecta, who specifically had to do the cleaning using their own hands rather than with any implement. That's according to Marshall. But it wasn't just the floor. Think about the walls and the ceiling. We've talked about the cornices and the uh, keeping them clean. But think about all that soot that would have gathered from the fire and the lamps. In fact, the word atrium may well have come from the word atrum, meaning blackened, because there was so much to keep uh, in check. And in cheaper houses, they may frankly have just whitewashed the walls on a regular basis. Not just the walls, not just the ceiling, not just the floor. What about all the furniture? Uh, if you are going to polish wooden furniture, you need olive oil. Or better than that, use a fish skin, which must have added a rather pleasant smell to all of your furniture. If you've got ivory to polish, you should use a radish. These are all very handy tips, I think, if we go into a second lockdown and supplies of cleaning products run short. If you've got metal to clean, goat hair is absolutely fantastic. For stone and marble, you want fine grain quartz, limestone powder, pumice or emery. And of course, airing and cleaning the furniture is a very good way to keep outdoor slaves occupied when it's wet weather. Thank Cato once again for that piece of advice. What about outside of the atrium? What about in the bedroom? Dare we think about cleaning and keeping uh, the mattresses in good order? Mattresses in the Roman world were effectively large bags filled with straw, wool or feathers. And as such, they often needed plumping, airing and changing. Um, but there's no evidence to how often any bed linens would actually be changed in the Roman world. Yes, the Roman house might well have existed on the same sets of bed linen for quite some time. And as a result, you won't be surprised to hear that bed bugs were a major problem. Although one Egyptian papyrus suggests mixing goat bile with water and sprinkling it around the home to keep bed bugs at bay. 
wears a bit of goat bile when you need it. We could be thinking also about the need to keep all the vessels in the kitchen clean. They had to be scoured to keep the metal ones free of rust. There was, in some rich households, slaves whose sole job it was just to delicately clean the silver. But it wasn't just inside the house that it turns out the master of the Roman house was responsible for. In fact, they also had a responsibility to keep the drains open and flowing. So uh, toilets uh, were kind of built in rich homes, mostly near the kitchen, makes perfect sense, um, because actually that would be nearer where the drain entrance was, or alternatively, they'd be in the garden. And occasionally a toilet would access straight into the drain, but more often than not, you'd have some kind of cesspit, and that cesspit would itself need to be cleaned out every couple of months, every few years, depending on how busy, how much it was in use. Uh, now, the mouths of cesspits in Pompeii uh, often actually led straight out to the street or uh, to the garden in order to make emptying them a bit easier. You didn't want your cesspit inside the home, and then when you were emptying it, have endless buckets of the mess being carted through your home as it was being emptied and thus being spilled everywhere. And you would in the Roman world pay for a service for outsiders to come along with some kind of large wagon uh, to then uh, take out the contents of your cesspit bucket by bucket, empty it into the wagon and the large container inside that, and then take it away. And this was an expensive job. We're told that at Herculaneum, it cost 11 asses to have your cesspit emptied when a cup of the very best wine was only four. So you're just under three cups of the very best wine to have your cesspit emptied, but by God, it would have been worth it. And the house owner is also responsible in the Roman world for keeping the public street in front of their home clean as well. Uh, so keeping it in good repair, cleaning out the gutters, making sure the road in front of you, in front of your home is accessible to vehicles was your responsibility. And renters had to do it if the owners of the property failed to do it, but they were allowed, according to Roman law, to claim back the costs of doing so from their next rent payments. Now, we just have to remember sometimes the size of the villas we're talking about. Pliny the Younger describes two of his villas. Uh, he has four dining rooms, 13 bedrooms, a bath suite, four further suites. And his other villa, his Laurentine villa, has 27 rooms in total, three dining rooms, six bedrooms, bath suite, and 18 other rooms. I pity the slave population. Um, but there was sometimes quite a significant slave population to be able to do this. Uh, Tastas Annals talks about the house of the city prefect, Padania Secundus, which had 400 slaves working in it. And we should give a brief thought to the other end of the spectrum, to the very poor person's home, where the floor would not be metal or uh, rather marble or stone in any way, it would just be trampled earth. But even they, could spruce up their home earth floor by adding in a little ox blood to it, which was said to give it a really nice shine. So if we move outside into the garden space, what kind of DIY and home improvements were going on in the garden? Now, of course, the garden was an important uh, sign of luxury within the Roman world. Uh, compared to the experience for the vast majority of people living in Rome, say in those multi-level apartment blocks that could go up to 10 blocks high, this was not uh, a necessarily uh, kind of space the way you would feel. You had any outdoor space to relax and enjoy. And if you had a garden, you were very wealthy. And if you couldn't quite afford to actually have a garden, of course, you could paint the walls of one of the rooms of your house to look like a garden scene uh, to show that you were enjoying it. So what went on in the garden? Spending time there, relaxing in your garden was a sign, of course, of your ability to enjoy otium, the leisure, luxurious leisure activity affordable to the wealthy. But did that include gardening and DIY? 
Well, we know that in the house of Julius Polybius, for instance, you can see here in the picture, he's got a very large garden in the sort of gray area for you there, Mark 12. It's a 10 meter by 10 meter garden. And he actually had fig, olive, lemon, and cherry trees requiring extensive continual picking. In fact, a bit of a ladder survives from Julius's garden, but it's probably not him doing the picking. Instead, again, his household slaves. Now, if you needed a professional gardener to do a very, very expert job on a particular part of your garden, you would, of course, call in a specialist. Pliny, we know, calls in someone who's known as a topiarius in order to get his Tuscan box hedges just so. You wouldn't want to be, be making a mistake with those Tuscan box hedges, now would you? But on the other hand, we know that many gardens also had vegetable patches. Would you, uh, here we can see in the house of the surgeon, in his garden at the back on the left, there was a nice little heredium vegetable patch where the seed analysis has shown that there was a full range being grown, fruits, nuts, plants. Uh, kitchen gardens and kitchen gardeners, those who were responsible for maintaining it, even had a little festival each year that they got to celebrate on August 19th. So when we get round to next August 19th, every one of you out there with your own little kitchen garden, do feel free to celebrate the Vinalia. Now, we know that in the garden, there was also lots of other activities going on that could really be considered, I guess, garden activities you might need to get some stuff for. You might be making perfume in the garden. You might be making that horrible Roman fish sauce, garum. You might just be relaxing, playing music, weaving. Lots of loom weights have been found in gardens. These are all important activities. And occasionally, perhaps even the masters and owners and family living in these houses might get involved in a little bit of what we might call garden improvement through decoration. And this would be particularly uh, from the perspective of uh, either displaying their conquests, conquests and acquisitions, particularly from overseas. Think about all those Romans who like to grab a Greek statue or two, bring it back and have it put up in their garden to show just how cultural they were. Or it's to do with religion and particular days when they're celebrating in the family of the house are celebrating uh, religious uh, festivals. Um, they may have made their own little garlands uh, to put on statues or particular masks for religious rites, um, kind of for things at uh, 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 different points in the year. So we've got our family perhaps indulging in a little bit of garden DIY at particular moments in the year for religious or show off purposes, while their slave populations are working hard keeping their vegetable patches and their cherry trees going at the same time, of course, as just keeping the house ticking over and being usable, using that sawdust the best uh, effect, as well as a bit of fish skin, never mind the goat hair, get the goat bile out to deal with the bed bugs, and occasionally hold your noses when the cesspit needs emptying and pay whatever they charge. But if we turn now to think about a particular case study of Pompeii, because Pompeii offers us really interesting opportunity to see renovation, home renovation, frozen in time. Because before the famous eruption, of course, of October 79, there was an eruption of Vesuvius in 62 AD, uh, which caused quite a bit of destruction in the town. And actually, Pompeii was in the process of repairing itself, and homes were in the process of being rebuilt when they were then again covered by the subsequent eruption of 79. And in fact, somebody actually thought it was a brilliant idea to uh, represent and commemorate the earthquakes and eruptions that happened in 62 in a relief panel. Um, this is the house of Caecilius Eucundus, who decided um, to display, although why you would want this kind of thing on display in your home, to have a quaking uh, temple uh, that you can see there off at an odd angle and everyone else looking very upset and worried by what's going on. There's a both people on either side of the temple structure there are on one leg as if they're about to sort of be knocked over by the earthquake. Why you would choose to have this commemorated on your wall, I have absolutely no idea, but there we are. But actually it turns out lots of the houses uh, show damage and renovation in play. 
bare plaster walls, temporary supports on walls, some places being occupied and renovated or just not occupied and abandoned. Many luxury homes have piles of lime dust, stacks of bricks and roofing tiles in them, heaps of marble ready to go down on the floor and lots of that precious pozzolana to make concrete. We could turn to the Casa del Pareti Rosse, the House of the Red Walls, which has its atrium filled with a broad mix of seemingly salvaged items from the earthquake, hoping perhaps for them to be put back into use at some point. A crushed bronze basin, mirror fragments, uh, marble fragments of a beautiful, what was once upon a time, a beautiful dolphin water spout. Indeed, also some broken statues in the garden waiting to be repaired. Or we could think about the Casa di Stalius Eros that has so much building debris in the surrounding rooms that actually people think it's probably been given over to be used as a builder's yard during this restoration period. Or the Villa Regina, country house near Pompeii. The kitchen is still covered in ash from the 62 eruption, not the 79. Um, the threshing floor is absolutely now being used as a rubbish dump. And in fact, at the junction of the villa and the public road, there's another massive rubbish dump. Uh, and just outside the entrance to the villa, there's a large heap of burnt materials and broken objects. It seems they were still in the process of just getting all the broken stuff out, let alone getting on uh, to repairing it. Although some, it seems, might have taken the chance of the 62 eruption to build bigger. In the House of the Vestals, there was a ramp at the back of that house constructed to allow wheelbarrow access. They seem to have actually been in the process of enlarging their house uh, rather than just repairing it. Indeed, there's even some hints, perhaps, of some kind of swimming pool being created. Sounds very nice. But my particular favourite is the House of the Painters at Work, so named because we have a moment in time, frozen in time here, where we really can see renovation in media res. Uh, now this is a house next door to that of Julius Polybius, who had that very nice garden with his cherry trees. Um, and there was major redecoration work going on. You can see in the map on the left-hand side here, the room under decoration, uh, which is where we're going to focus. Now, uh, there were piles of lime found around, there was sand, there was mosaic tesserae left in the house, all ready to go down on some nice floors. But the painters were in the middle of their work redecorating this uh, room uh, as the eruption of 79 happened. And they seem to have literally down their paintbrushes and run for it mid brushstroke. There's traces of scaffolding around, jars of plaster, mixing bowls, as well as 50 little pots of paint uh, all stacked neatly, ready to be used. And if we look at particularly at the north wall of this room, which are the images you're seeing in black and white at the center and then in color on the right hand side, we get a sense of how these painters actually worked. They seem to have started at the top and then worked their way down the sections of the wall as they finished and painted them. Um, so the very bottom level of the wall, as you can see here, and as the sort of dado, has not been given yet its final coat of plaster, let alone being painted. And at the time of the eruption, they seem to have been focusing on the middle level. Now, this is a true fresco technique they're using. So they're plastering, and then while the plaster is still wet, they're adding the paint in order that the paint really fastens in and dries well. So what we can see here, and we can go a little bit closer up uh, here as well, is we've got two main panels, the red and the black, which seem to have been finished down to that lower section of the wall. And you can see in close up on the left hand side of the image, the little characters that have been beautifully painted and finished off on the red side. And on the right hand side, you get a close up of some of the beautiful characters from the black side. Lovely tiny figures, groups, uh, nothing more uh, exciting, I think, to have on your wall, you will agree. And then on the left, on the uh, red side, um, cupids racing their chariots pulled by goats. It's a classic image, particularly when you think about all that goat hair and goat bile being used around the house to keep it clean. But you could also see how other parts of the wall are not yet finished. In particular, the final uh, central picture and we can close in on it here. Here you've got the red outline, but the actual central picture has not yet at all been finished, but it has been sketched out. And you can just see that 
uh, at the bottom half of the picture. It's a rough drawing in yellow ochre that's been made into the wet plaster to plan out the design and guide the painter. We've got figures, we've got legs, but who knows what it was intended to be finally. So we've got this beautiful image in our heads, I think, at the House of the Painters at Work of people in the middle of their skillful task of redecorating a room destroyed in 62 uh, and never allowed to finish their great work. Who were these people? Right? Very often we can't get anywhere near them, uh, but occasionally we see these great craftsmen. Here is indeed at the top left, a fresco of a carpenter at work, uh, kind of from the house we think of the Vetti. And on the right, one of my personal favorites, it's the architect, it's the signature of an architect, Crescens, Crescens Architectus, who comes from the house of Tripotelimus. And he's actually incorporated his signature into the picture of a ship and put it in the peristyle, an absolutely classy little sign for those who are looking for it. But it seems that house renovation or rather salvaging didn't stop in Pompeii in 79, because my final example is this, the house of N. Popidius Priscus, which has an inscription scraped onto the right wall of the entranceway, simply saying house tunneled through. And yes, they found big holes smashed in the walls as people seem to have gone back through and excavated after the eruption in order to grab whatever they could out of the house. It's written in Latin, but with Greek letters, so it isn't the owner, it's a rather opportunistic salvage team. And on that note, I will leave you to think more, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions about Roman DIY and house maintenance. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, Michael. That was absolutely brilliant. And it's actually, um, it stimulated a whole bunch of uh, very interesting questions. I, I, I did, when we discussed it before the talk, you, and, you, and you said there's a massive amount of renovation work in Pompeii um, before the 79 um, AD eruption, it did strike me as being very poignant. Imagine spending all that money on your house and you're inviting your friends around and suddenly Vesuvius blows up. I mean, it's the equivalent yeah. of washing the car on a rainy day, isn't it? Yeah, obviously, worse than that. But it's such terrible timing. Terrible timing. I just still cannot get my head around of why you'd want to commemorate an earthquake in a fresco in your home, though, of, in any form. Okay, why that you would want that as your art on your wall, I don't know. I would imagine it would, maybe he's the equivalent of a kind of, maybe he, was a, he had a, a kind of satirical point of view on it. Maybe it was a kind of conversation breaker, you know, you're going for dinner and someone says, you see, I thought it was rather, it's, it, it's the equivalent of a funny poster, isn't it? I suppose, up on your yeah. wall, it gets people talking. Well, look, we, we have some questions for you, which are pouring in from our audience. Um, so, uh, we, well, from our youngest classicist, I think, who's 11 years of old, 11 years of age, Louis, He's, he's, he's asking if why did if it's so bad for you to lay on your stomach while you're eating, why did rich people seem to do that in the ancient world? Oh, OK. Um, so, well, of course, lying down, this goes back to the, the Greek way of doing things before the Romans, right? This kind of lying down was the sign that you were a paid up kind of citizen of your community, right? People who were not old enough yet, like uh, you know, the young man asking the question, to be a fully adult citizen. They were the ones who had to sit up like we do today, right? They didn't get the chance to lie down. And again, it's just this aspect of taking up the space, having the luxury to be able to do it. Um, and then of course, uh, kind of going forward to quaff and eat as much as you can. I mean, I think today we find it doubly difficult because we're so unused to supporting ourselves on one arm and then eating just with the other arm. At Warwick every year, we recreate the ancient Greek and Roman drinking and eating experience and get them to use uh, replica vessels, which we tell the parents are filled with Ribena, but it's actually wine, honest, uh, and uh, kind of uh, and try and get them thinking about how it, how it was. And people find it very, very difficult to hold that sort of position for any length of time. Can I ask you a question which occurred to me is because it was, a, it was um, because there was a, a, you know, a, a competitive if you think about Petronius's um, Satyricon and, and the very funny Trimalchio's feast, how competitive the people were, w was there any room for an interior designer to inveigle their way into a rich household and start making them, the matron convince the master to spend thousands of denarii on things that, it, that they didn't really need? 
So that's a really interesting question. Was there ever a kind of uh, interior designer per se who could be brought in to sort of make over, make over your home, you know, for the fresh season? I don't think we see it as a, as a, as a job per se, but certainly kind of, I think, kind of if you got a group of painters to come in, like those, that group that were working on the house of the, of the, the painters at work in Pompeii, um, they would come in with a new set of ideas. And the fashions in terms of what you had on your wall were definitely constantly changing. And so I think if you really were a very wealthy individual, you would want to redecorate your home on a, on a fairly regular basis to offer a new and exciting uh, backdrop um, for people to come and enjoy when they came to, to your dinner. Uh, alongside, of course, making sure that there was no kind of last minute dog poo uh, kind of left uh, across the atrium. And what I was amazed to find is that, that obviously alongside this, obviously mat, uh, rats and mice are a problem, as you can imagine. And the Romans actually preferred dogs to keep control of mats, uh, of, I'm getting them always confused, rats and mice rather than cats. Romans didn't, didn't buy into the kind of cats chasing away the mice and the rats. There. Dogs were much preferred uh, for it. So when you see uh, those great signs on the, on the floor, carwe carnem, you know, where kind of beware of the dog, actually the dog was there not just as a kind of guard dog figure, but actually as a uh, rat and mice chaser as well. And so perhaps you would happily put up with an occasional dropping from the dog on your atrium floor uh, if they kept the, the rats and mice at bay. Yeah. Now we have a question here from uh, Amy, Amy Garrett, who said there are so many beautiful examples of uh, Pompeian Pompeian frescoes. Do we know if these were painted by professional artists or slaves? And would a, a rich householder ever turn his or her hand to decorating his own house, or would it, or just be purely relying on on uh, these artists? And were they slaves, or were they? Uh, no. So the, the art, you know, they are craftsmen. They're considered craftsmen. Now they they occupy a a slightly odd social position within Roman society, right? But they're definitely not slaves, although the craftsmen may have had slaves accompanying them as the sort of lackeys to, to carry the bounds, as it were. Um, but I don't, I just, I just can't imagine a scenario in which the kind of master and ruling family of, of the house is actually gonna get involved in the painting themselves. Um, you know, th there is this very strong distinction uh, between your, you know, if you can afford it, you want to be spending your life in this otium, in this leisure and luxury. So, you know, I think the best we can imagine is the kind of Roman master and mistress uh, from a couch or from their garden uh, sort of seat, sort of directing uh, with one hand, sort of saying, do this, uh, do that, go and pick the cherry trees, that kind of thing. And um, was there any, any evidence that we have, uh, which would be fabulous if there were, um, of disagreements between marital couples about which way to go with interior design. I'm not saying I'm speaking from personal experience in this, but you know, um, I got my way with the green in this room, by the way, but uh, yeah. uh, any, any evidence at all of that? Uh, well, I think it would depend very much on the space of the house that was being uh, decorated. If this was uh, the, the dining room, uh, or one of the public spaces that were meant for outsiders, I have a feeling that the master of the house would have the final word. If this was uh, the individual bedrooms, um, which were often always very sparsely decorated, Romans never invested much in their bedrooms at all because they really were just spaces to go and sleep and often would have very little light because of the shutters. Uh, but that might be more of a space where the uh, individuals who had the rooms got a chance to to sort of choose their decoration. Um, I have no doubt uh, that there were significant uh, kind of disagreements along the way uh, about what should be uh, put in the garden. I can just imagine some Roman saying, I've done it. I've got a hundred Greek statues that I've nabbed from Greece that are being delivered tomorrow. Uh, and then going, sorry, I didn't want those in my garden and there being a, a dispute ensuing. Um, but sadly, it's not the kind of thing that gets captured in our surviving evidence too readily. It's a shame that Juvenal didn't um, write a satire about that. Would, um, now I've got a question here from Sean Clare, and I think uh, uh, it says, would laundry be done on site by slaves or would it have been sent to proper laundry businesses? Laundry businesses, most of the time. Again, depending on where this house is. So kind of if this is a country villa, outside of the city there may well have been laundry done 
kind of on site. But certainly if you were anywhere within uh, a kind of urban community, you'd be sending out your laundry. And indeed laundry places, and there's been some fantastic work on this recently, are very smelly places because what are they using as their detergent of choice? It's urine absolutely is the cleaning agent par excellence. So these places smell to high heaven um, and you really wouldn't want your home anywhere near them. Um, and indeed kind of that's raised the question about whether people's clothes came back from the laundry smelling a little bit of pee still and we think they did but that this was taken as a sign and symbol of their cleanliness uh, kind of alongside your um, uh, your wood furniture smelling perhaps a little bit of fish skin uh, or your uh, kind of use of goat bile sprinkled around the home to keep away the bed bugs. Uh, we have to really repopulate the Roman world with so many more strong smells than we are used to uh, thinking about in our modern world. And um, I'm just thinking about Roman Britain. Did the, did, did the locals adopt Roman style fairly easily? Did they think it was the, the in thing to do? Uh, was, was it embraced or did they resist it really trying to you know, claim their national culture and protect the, the, the Celtic traditions or did they really just think this is fabulous all this Roman stuff? It's a bit of a mix of the two depending again on who you're talking to. So there was obviously a kind of uh, Roman, a British elite who wanted to then imitate the kind of beautiful Roman villas they started seeing around them. Uh, uh, and so you get kind of imitation of Roman architecture. You also get this kind of acculturation and amalgamation. So we do talk about Romano-British architecture, but you tend to see that much more in the sort of public space. So temples, for instance, in Roman Britain had a very weird and very individualized Romano-British format that sort of amalgamated uh, you know, pre-Roman uh, Britain ways of doing things with Roman architecture. Uh, and in fact, one of the ways that Romans loved to sort of have creeping influence on places that they hadn't actively and totally subjugated militarily was to volunteer to come along and help build a bit of their public community space. So if you go over to Wales, uh, you know, where the Romans sort of drew the line and went, God, we can't take on the job of uh, subjugating militarily all these kind of violent uh, Welsh tribes. But actually, you see a number of these Welsh tribal communities sort of near the border with the Roman world who have nicely little built Roman forums kind of in their community uh, that they've sort of had Roman architects and Roman builders come in to do. So that kind of use of Roman architecture was a sort of soft power thing to try and get these people, although they're not subjugated by us, sort of into a way of thinking that's our way of thinking. Right, a, a question here is, were there any massive um, DIY fails in, in the ancient world? What were the main complaints from Roman household or shoddy work? Uh, surely, well, well, I mean, as we, I think uh, a little bit of it is um, to do with the fact that, you know, depending when, when I, the Roman Britain example that I started with of the baths, the 126 bath sites that really do look like there's been continual alteration and repair by a whole series of bodge builders and cowboy builders. You know, I think partly that's to do with the fact that kind of they're having to operate in in weather conditions <laughs> that they're just not used to from their nice Mediterranean sunny homes. Um, and of course the Roman Empire spreads out over such a wide range of different climates and places that it has to spend some time adapting. Um, but by and large, uh, kind of, you know, we, we're not seeing a number of massive failures. The Romans did know what they were doing with building. And, uh, you, you know, we have to remember that it's the Romans who invented concrete and they had a concrete that was so good, it could even set underwater, right? Using this kind of magical volcan volcanic pozzolana tufa material that was um, so prevalent in Italy. And so it's this concrete and the invention of these new building techniques that really allows the Romans to then just do things which people thought were impossible uh, on a regular basis. Um, and, uh, and they keep breaking the boundaries of the possible in, in architecture as a result. So I don't think, you know, there are any kind of obvious DIY disasters that we can see, uh, beyond which, obviously, it could take time. I mean, I think the example of Pompeii is a really interesting one that, 
you know, the eruption was in 62, 79, right? We're talking kind of 17 years on, and there's still an awful lot of renovation work going on. So when a town like that was actually uh, heavily uh, destroyed, there would be only a limited number of builders and craftsmen who could be there working at any one point in time. And there probably would have been a very complicated pecking order for who got their house done and repaired first. Uh, that you would have to sort of, you know, perhaps grease the skids, bit of a back payment here, back payment there to sort of jump the queue. So I think in that time, it, it's not so much that they couldn't do it and that they would end up with disasters, but that it did take time simply because of the available numbers of people and, and, and materials. So, so nothing's changed there then. I've been involved with builders like that. Um, it's taken a lot, 17 years to do a job. Now, uh, there's something here from Samantha um, Banner, who's not as much a question, but... She said, we always teach our pupils that a piece of information for us that, uh, that in Caecilius's house, he had a relief showing the earthquake on his, uh, um, uh, on his walls to thank the gods for saving him and his family. Is that a valid reason, do you think? Okay, so yeah, I mean, so that might be kind of a nice way to think about it, isn't it? I mean, I still, here's the event we all survived through. I mean, I'm, again, it's very hard. We, we have to avoid, and you're quite right, we have to avoid using our modern kind of mindsets to understand why they would do something in the ancient world. Um, you know, kind of, I, I don't think, I don't think today many of us would go down the line of, you know, uh, here's that epic disaster uh, that we just managed to survive through up on our wall to remind us. But you're absolutely right that in a conceptual world in which the gods can be both for you and against you, um, and kind of if they're against you, you really haven't got uh, much of a chance. The idea of surviving through something like that might actually put you in mind of the gods being on your side, right? You, you know, this happened, but you were the ones who survived. And as a result, in that respect, you might want to put that image up, uh, as they say, to, to celebrate the fact that, that the gods like you. That seems, yeah, that seems like a good explanation to me. Well, on that note, I must say we've only scratched the surface of the thousands of questions we were sent in, Michael. So thank you very much on behalf of everybody who uh, is here today. Um, thank you so much. I'm, there's a, a whole list of thanks. Great talk. Thank you, Professor. Uh, amazing talk. Thank you so much. Never thought of this aspect of Roman life at all. Stunning. Thank you. What a, where to access the recorded video. You can actually catch it on YouTube, folks. So don't feast your eyes and, and enjoy it again on YouTube. Um, I've just got a bit of housekeeping uh, to, um, to wrap up with. Um, I want to thank everybody who organized this, uh, uh, Tom and Alice and Hillary, um, uh, uh, for uh, the, our backstage crew who've allowed us to clamber onto Zoom um, and helped me enormously to try and get through this. Um, and uh, just to say that COVID, of course, has hit every charity and uh, Classics for All is no exception. Uh, it's forced us to cancel uh, most of our fundraising events. As you can imagine, this really impairs um, uh, our ability to get into schools and to get Latin and Greek and classical civilization in front of young people who are literally gobbling it up and why wouldn't they? Um, so if you can Google Classics for All, you'll see a website which will point you to all kinds of ways you can help in terms of donations, uh, etc. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Most of all, I'd like to thank Professor Michael Scott for a fantastic talk. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you, and good night.